and hell lost someplace. Of course, I had to go find her. <laughs> well, you know when it's worth worthless to spend time arguing. So up I went, calling out for Eloise, and of course she was safely with some other group of people. I had all the way up to the top and it was pitch black. And I thought, this is great. I'm going to fall down, kill myself on some rock here. They're going to find my dead body tomorrow morning up here. But of course, Our Lady had more in store for me. Made it safely down to the bottom of the hill. Of course, Margie had abandoned me. So I went back to our pension, went to bed, and I was reading, and Margie appeared. Of course, she says, where were you? I said, where was I? I was polishing stones up and down Apparition Hill. Where were you? Well, she had sat there in the plaza looking behind her shoulder at one of the stores, and a shopkeeper saw her and motioned her in, and she is the ultimate shopper. She, she couldn't leave empty-handed, so she said, this is uh, what I found. She said, I got this big glass crystal cross. I had to buy something from them. I said, well, that's great. We only have about 50 of those back home. <laughs> Can never have enough crosses. And I'm sure it's going to be in my suitcase, and I'll have to lug it home. So the next day, uh, Yozo took us to uh, see one of the visionaries, Yakov. And Yakov told his story while all of us stood around the perimeter of his yard. And just uh, as matter-of-factly as you can imagine, while Yozo translated for him, he said two things that really impressed me. One was, people say, why were you one of the chosen ones? And he says, I don't know. I don't have any clue. I was 10 years old. I wasn't thrilled about going to Mass every day, praying the rosary. I wanted to just be like anybody else and play with my friends. I have no idea. So that was honest and impressive. The other thing that moved me was, he said that when they were on Apparition Hill, they could not wait to see her again because they were all filled with the overwhelming sense of love that she had for them. Well, he had to believe this guy. and. The wheels kept turning. The next day, we went up to Mount Krushvik, and that's the mountain where, in the 1930s, the people of the village, mostly women because the men were at war, carried 16 tons of concrete up this mountain. I mean, you, you can barely walk up the mountain without carrying any kind of load. And they erected a huge cross, which you can see for miles and miles. And after you get up there and you see this monument to their faith, it was to commemorate 2,000 years since the crucifixion. Uh, it's, it's very powerful, very moving. And then we went to Mass, and now we're getting close to Easter. So Medjugorje is just packed with people from all over the world. The church is filled. Char and Janie were standing just outside the church, and I was in the back of the courtyard leaning up against a tree. And Char could see that I was going through this change, this turmoil. And it occurred to her, if only somebody like Monsignor Friedel could be here for Peter. He's, he's wise, he's an author, he's written books, he's been president of Loras College, he's a funny guy, he loves to tell stories, he loves to play golf. I'm sure he could find the right words to help Peter. And what are the chances of that happening? So somebody taps Char on the shoulder, they start talking. Turns out this person is from Chicago. Char says, well, is Monsignor Friedel with you by any chance? Well, of course. <laughs> if you ever have seen how wide Char Vance's eyes can open up, she was ready to bolt, and Janie grabbed her and said, you can't go anywhere without communion. And that's not going to happen because the whole place is just mobbed with people. Before Shark could even think about it, there was a priest standing in front of her saying, Body of Christ. So for, for the first time in her life, Char became a body snatcher. <laughs> grabbed communion and ran over and grabbed me, threw me into a cab. I said, where are we going? She said, never mind, you'll find out. We pulled up in front of this house, barged in on this group of people, and Char yells out, where's Monsignor Friedel? Well, he appeared, and she introduced us. We sat down and started talking, and felt like I had known him forever. We had a couple glasses of wine, and, and after telling him 
what I was going through, I finally asked him my toughest question. I said, I just don't understand why bad things happen to good people. And with hardly any hesitation, he looked at me and he said, God gave his only son. Now, any other time in my whole life, that would have been meaningless to me. But at that particular time, it hit me right between the eyes. I was dumbfounded. I said, I'll have to think about that. When I mentioned this to him sometime later, he laughed. He said, I have no recollection of saying that at all. I don't know where that came from. It had to be the Holy Spirit. And at that time, uh, he was staying with Mary Sue and Larry Eck. Mary Sue came up and invited Margie and me to join them and all the people they had with them. The next day, they were going to Father Yozo's parish. Father Yozo was the priest who sheltered the visionaries from the communists, and he was going to bless their marriage vows. One little problem, everybody had come prepared with a cross that was big enough for them to put their hands on, and Father Yozo could put his hands on, and of course, there wasn't time to go shopping. I said, I think we just got one of those. <laughs> so we were lucky enough to join these people and uh, met Father Yozo, celebrated Mass. He showed us the tomb where, in 1945, 20 priests had been executed by the communists for not renouncing their faith. And then we went to a chapel behind the church where he came up to each one of us individually, put his hands on ours, and blessed our marriage. And if anybody felt less deserving than I did, um, we finally went back to Medjugorje, and I went to find Monsignor Friedel again. Sat down with him, I said, I've got another question for you. I said, how do I become a Catholic? So the next day was our last day there. We went to Mass at St. James Church, and afterwards we had a little time to go shopping. As I said before, Margie's the ultimate shopping shopper. When word gets out that she's going to Europe, their stock market goes up 10 points. <laughs> and I learned that uh, when the visionaries are going through one of their sessions with the Blessed Mother, it's called ecstasy. They go into a trance-like state. It occurred to me that the same kind of thing happens to Margie when she's shopping. You can tap her on the shoulder, she doesn't hear you. You talk to her, she doesn't hear you. So I left her there and I went to another place. I found myself looking at rosaries and didn't know quite what I was looking for and there's just bin after bin after bin. Finally, I found this one. That looked just perfect. It had a nice crucifix, red beads, and some kind of gold medallion at the bottom of the circle. Margie appeared and she said, what are you doing? I said, buying a rosary. She said, I've got all the ones I need. I said, this one's for me. The tears started rolling down her face. And she said, what's that gold medallion at the bottom of the circle? I said, I don't know. We'll ask uh, Father Pat when we get back to our pension. Father Pat was a priest from Kenya, gave beautiful renditions of the mysteries of the rosary. And he had been listening to my story and following my progress from day to day. So he brought the rosary to him and asked him what that medallion was. A smile came across his face and he says, you of all people with your story about the popes, in all of Medjugorje where everything is about the Blessed Mother, you must have found the only rosary with the papal coat of arms on it. So we went back to Italy, spent the night in uh, Assisi, had um, great experience in the uh, Basilica of St. Francis. We heard a wonderful homily about the perfect joy of St. Francis. Went back to Rome, and Guy had arranged for all of us to attend the canonization of St. Faustina. One of the priests in our group was also an MD who had done research 